as we get started here a few tips one if you're not familiar with working with this type of equipment get some assistance or sit down with somebody who understands this type of equipment and work with them for a while and pick up some safety habits this equipment is not transistorized this equipment has high voltage in it and it can kill you not only is there the 115 AC coming in here we've got the power supply the DC power supply here which carries enough energy to do you in even worse are the All American 5 sets that do not have a power transformer at least this has its own internal power transformer and isolates you for the most part from the line with the exception of these connections here and the 120 or whatever your line voltage is AC on the switch so there's 120 or 115 or 110 whatever wherever you live maybe 220 if you have a European version of this there's exposed terminals here that turn the AC off and on there's exposed terminals here these chokes everything in this area is sitting at line voltage potential it can kill you everything here and many places in here are running at B plus potential and I forget exactly what it is let's see what the voltage chart tells us we're looking at voltages at least oh there's got to be a B plus voltage here somewhere we're looking at voltages of at least 105 volts DC now that's not as high as some sets I see sets to go up well over 230 to 280 volts still the potential is there to kill you I started to talk about uh, all American fives the AC DC sets they'll run on AC current or DC current many if not most of them have one side of the line connected directly to the metal chassis there's no power transformer they use the chassis as the common ground and the line is connected it's supposed to be the neutral side of the line but many of those sets do not have polarized plugs you turn the plug around then you have 120 volts sitting on the chassis you touch that you touch your test equipment with, with, a, with a different hand one hand here one hand there you're dead always 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 use an isolation transformer I'm using in this shop or this room I'm using this Heath kit unit it is a combination isolation transformer variac amp meter voltmeter I've said this in other videos Variax are not isolation transformers by themselves they have one side common to the line you need a dedicated isolation transformer they're available at most of the flea markets they're available on eBay you might balk at the price of some of them it's your life don't sue me I've told you do not play around in there unless you know what you're doing okay tip number two documentation I have both the riders John F riders version of the manual and I have the Sam's photo fact version of the manual if I could only have one or the other I will go with the Howard Sam's there's usually a lot more detail this Howard Sam's version gives me the alignment for both using a standard signal generator and using an FM signal generator and an oscilloscope the type of alignment we're going to do today so it gives you both of those it also gives you the alignment patterns that you sh should expect to see when you're using this type of equipment the sweep generator and the uh, oscilloscope there is one piece of information on the John Ryder's one that's not on the SAMs and they show you what to use for dummy antennas now the SAMs describe it but they don't show you the actual wiring you know it, it's left up to you to understand how that works with the SAMs 
if possible, get both of them. There's usually some information on one that's not available on the other, and it's always handy to have both of them. They both show the dial cord winding. They both show all the alignment points. But the SAMS is typically a clearer document with usually a little more information. Having this information is invaluable. You might have to pay $10 or $11 to buy one of these and maybe a buck or two shipping. eBay has a lot of this stuff available. However, when you're working on these sets, there's nothing like having the servicing information, the schematics, the voltage charts, the resistance charts to ground. They can get you out of a lot of trouble. Alrighty, we have our receiver powered up. I have my uh, sweep generator, and in this case we're using the precision. The sweep generator is going into the grid of the uh, second IF tube where they tell us to put it in the documentation. I have my demodulator probe here. My demodulator probe in this instance, instead of going straight to the oscilloscope, it could, but in this instance it's going over to the sweep generator to where it says receiver response. That's because it's going to mix my marker signal in with my demodulated signal from the receiver. So the receiver response on this particular unit is where I plug in my demodulator block. We have coming back out the scope vertical input. This goes to the vertical input on the oscilloscope up above here. Can we see that? There's a lot of reflection. We'll move the camera here shortly. This gives us the vertical part of the deflection. The straight line you see here is the retrace. Oh, I got a delivery. Is a retrace. It sweeps this direction and then blanks the oscillator and sweeps back. And then sweeps this direction, blanks the oscillator and sweeps back. Some units, uh, one of the, in fact, I think it's this unit right here, has a switch you can select and turn off the retrace and only have the main trace, the main curve showing. Your preference as to what you want to do. Down here on the sweep generator, we have the scope horizontal input. That is going to my X input on the scope. The scope is in XY mode. That disables the internal sweep circuitry of the scope, completely disconnects it, and connects the horizontal deflection amplifier to this input. This is now being driven by a 60 cycle sine wave, or uh, sawtooth wave rather, from the uh, sweep generator down below. That gives us our horizontal sweep. That is also sweeping the oscillator or varying the oscillator inside of the marker generator here so that as the sweep goes across the scope we're starting at some value below our center of the IF frequency sweeping through our 10.7 megahertz and then down to the end it sweeps above that frequency. Present, uh, I'll try to make that a little clearer here in just a second. Let me finish down here. We have our RF output, the frequency of which is determined by this dial. This is the input right now presently set, uh, going into the receiver, into the IF of the receiver. And we adjust this for our 10.7 megacycle center frequency or thereabouts. These drift all over the place, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Here we have one of the marker crystals. That marker crystal happens to be the center of the IF 10.7 megahertz, and it's actually operating at, let me find the frequency counter here. What I do with, oh, it's over here. I'm gonna try to zoom in. The camera may get a little glitchy. Okay, we have 5.349985. That's a 349. Yeah, that's a 9. 
Double that, you have 10.7 megahertz, just about. It's about 100, no, it's 80, 90, 100. It's about 25 hertz off. Is that right? No, 85, 90, 15 hertz. We're 15 hertz off. Not a big deal. We don't really care. But if you double that frequency, you end up with 10.7 megahertz. The unit will give us our 10 point megahertz center, uh, center marker here on the scope. I'm making, a, I'm botching this pretty badly, aren't I? Oh well. I'm getting old. So be it. I'm going to try zooming a little bit and see if the camera will deal with it. Oh, it's going out of focus. As a say, focus you fack. Not too bad. That little squiggly piece you see is being generated by the crystal. Now I'm going to adjust the sweep oscillator to put that in the center of our display. Right in the center, there's a piece of it that's kind of doing a V that's inverting itself in the center. It's wiggly on both sides and in the center it's doing this. That is the center of our IF. That is our 10.7 tar megahertz target. If I remove that crystal, you can see that goes away. You can see our IF is tuned off to the side. It's not properly aligned. Here's 10.775. One another one of the crystals I ground. That's our 70 plus 75 kilohertz and it falls centered just about one division over from where our 10.5 is so the center line on the scope is our 10.7 megahertz this line here is our 10775 upper side of the IF curve then I have another crystal the 10.625 Oh, did I pick up the right one? No, I didn't. I picked up the wrong one. There's the 10.625. That's embarrassing. And it falls on the division that's on the other side of the center line. So now that we've calibrated our scope, and I got, I attained this by adjusting the gain on the horizontal sweep until these two points fell one division either side of the center line. I could move them out two divisions if I wanted to, but then the sweep starts looking pretty stretched out and it's kind of hard to visualize the curve. This is good enough. There's our 10625. I'll pull that crystal out, put it up there. We don't need it anymore because we've already figured out where on the scope we are. There's our 10775. I'll put that up on the top. We don't need it anymore. And I'm going to leave the 10.7 megahertz center frequency plugged in to the marker generator, <clears throat> excuse me, to the sweep generator and leave that marker there because this generator moves around. And by doing this, I can recenter it as long as I have that reference point every time I can come back to the center and then tune my IF so that this curve is centered around that in the center of the screen. I hope that makes sense. All right, I am going to find my little diddle sticks here and we will proceed. Oh, I've got the, oh, focus you son of a gun. There it is. I'm gonna back away from there. We have an RF level control or output attenuator on the marker generator. However, I have that pretty much, well I have it on the least amount of attenuation and the pot that adjusts the level, <clears throat> excuse me, is about at half way, half scale, half whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to use this attenuator to attenuate my signal to try to keep me below the uh, below a level where the, the pattern starts to distort. So we'll come back up here 
and I'm going to add more signal. Or, oh, man, yeah, I'll add more signal. You can see the pattern starting to distort because I'm overdriving the IF amp. So that's a reasonable amount of signal to work with. I can see my flat topping. I turn everything off and give it full blast here. You can see what happens to the pattern when I do that. So I'm going to dial in, whoops, that's 10 dB too much. No, that's another 20. There's 10 dB. There's 15 dB, a little too much. 10, 11, 12. And yeah, we'll leave it there. Now you can see the generators drifted on us already. It doesn't take these things long to get out of. Oh, too much. That puts us in the center. And the only reason I'm concerned about keeping that in the center, I could do this visually either side of that marker if I wanted to. However, I want to try to keep it somewhere near these two divisions. It wouldn't matter. I could slide this over here and use the divisions either side of that. Like so. And then simply use the center one and the second one over here. Use the first away from the center as my uh, center of the IF, but let's keep everything centered up. I'm doing a terrible job of this. Okay, now that my signal generator is hooked up, it wants me to adjust A1, A3, and A4 to begin with. Then I'm going to look at my documentation. tells me A4 is this center one here. Okay, it was A1, A3, A4. So A1 and A3 I think are inside on the bottom. Let's see. A3 is the center one on the inside and the bottom. And A4 where the heck is A4? That's A5, A1. Okay, so we want A1, which is the outside one. So, down here. A1, A3, and I shouldn't really be sticking my finger in there, but A3 is there, A1 is here, A4 is on the top, in the middle on the other side. So let's see what we can do. Uh, where's my new diddle stick that doesn't leak voltage? That's not it, this is it. Okay, let's see what we get. See, that brought that lump that's on the right down some, but it also brought us up a little bit on the right, on the left hand side. Uh, well, there we go. You can see how this, this is uh, A3. You can see how that shifts the curve over. So we want to bring that probably there to that line just to the left of the 10.7. Let's see what we get when I go to the top one. All right, let's go back down here. And it's a matter of working your way around. There we go. That flattened it out. This side extends out a little bit further than that one still, so I'm going to try to get a little more on, on to the left. And we'll be going through this again when we move it to the next stage of IF amplification. Oops. That didn't do what I wanted it to do. There we go.
that's not horrible. There's one, one, this division, this division, we're still pretty close to our center frequency. I'm just going to touch it up a little bit. Oops. So this gives us 75 kilohertz of bandwidth. This gives us 75 kilohertz of bandwidth, 150 kilohertz total. And we've actually got a little more than that because it doesn't even drop to the 3dB point until well outside. But we've centered up on our 10.7 IF, which is important because our frequency is going to deviate back and forth from the center frequency. And we want to have equal gain on, for the IF on both sides of our center frequency. <clears throat> if that makes sense, I hope. Okay, our next point to move to is the high side pin 7 grid of the 12AT7. So I've got to move. Let me get this set up. All right, what we've done so far is we were connected to the grid of this 6BA6. We are now going to, or we, what we aligned with, was these two IF transformer coils and this coil here, which is the input to our ratio detector. And they have you start here in case, if everything's horribly out of alignment, it's really hard to start at the head of the chain. So they break the chain up into two sections, the IF chain. We're going to st we started with the 6BA6, we injected a signal into this grid. We tuned this coil, this coil, and this coil. I am picking my detected signal off, or I'm using my uh, demodulator probe over here on the output of the ratio detector on this point over here. Now I'm going to move upstream and I'm going to go to the grid here which is going to inject the signal into these two coils and then I'll adjust these then they'll have me go back touch these up then we'll come over here touch these up and then we'll touch up the ratio detector to center that around our IF um, frequency okay we've moved the sweep generator to that grid on the converter tube so now we have two stages of IF in line and it wants me to adjust, I believe it's A5 and A6. Yes, A5 and A6. Now it already looks pretty good. Let me recenter just a little bit. Oops, too far. Okay. Let's see what A5 and A6 will gain us. Actually, I think we could probably get a little gain out of it right there. Yeah, let's see if I can bring the other side up to match that. There we go. So we've picked up a little bit of gain. And we've drifted in frequency again. Get our 10.7 back in the middle. We've lost a little bit of bandwidth, however, at the same time. I'd like to see that a little bit wider. Maybe I'll sacrifice some gain for a little bit more bandwidth. So I'm going to bring it back down. This receiver, by the way, is extremely sensitive. It does an incredibly good job, uh, even on its little internal antenna that's connected to the AC line cord. I'm very impressed with the... Uh... Okay, that brought some gain up, but I want to shift it back over to the left-hand side. We don't have good symmetry now. Sometimes you've got to go through this process two or three times. Oh, there we go. Now we've got gain and symmetry.
I would like to see the bandwidth a little bit wider though, a little bit more outside these two lines. But in theory we have our 75 kilohertz of bandwidth. I'm going to change crystals here and we'll put a marker. You can see the center of that marker falls right on that line. <clears throat> And we'll put the other one in, and the center of that marker falls right on that line. There's our center frequency again. Oh, uh, maybe I'll go back. I'm going to move the uh, input back one stage and touch up those other three cans again. Okay, I've gone back to the, the, uh, to the IF amplifier which is in between the two IF transformers. So now there's only one IF transformer in the circuit. And you can see we've picked up bandwidth because of that. We're only going through one stage of IF. The more stages of IF you go through, not only do you pick up gain with each amplifier, but you also narrow the bandwidth slightly. Typically the more, uh, more tuned resonant circuits you go through, the narrower your bandwidth gets. I am going to just try a little touch up on these and see if I can get some more bandwidth here so when we go to the first IF, we have a little more, so okay. I'm shifting that over to the left. Ah, get on the screw correctly here. Are we recording? Yes, we are. And this is just a matter of trying each adjustment until you get a feel for what adjustment affects where on the, on the curve. So you get a feel for how everything interacts. Every receiver is a little bit different. No, that's just going to make it non-symmetrical trying to pick up that gain there. All right, I'm going to put it back where it was. I don't think we're going to gain anything. There's that hump on that side. If you did the same make and brand of receiver every day, you'd get to the point where you could probably knock these out in 10 minutes because you know how everything interacts and what to expect for a typical IF curve from a particular brand of receiver or model of receiver. But when we're doing this to these old radios, Every one of them is a new adventure. Now we've lost a little gain there, but we've got a pretty flat response curve. Maybe I can get that just a little better. Now, I don't want to lose too much gain, but That's a pretty broad response curve right there. You can see we have, if I shut off the uh, marker, you can see what I'm talking about when I say the double hump. That gives us a reasonably flat within less than a dB area in the middle of our bandpass <clears throat> so that the frequency response is fairly uniform across the entire bandpass. When you start getting out here outside of the bandpass, it's not very important. What's important is the area between minus 75 and plus 75 kilohertz in relationship to our 10.7 IF center frequency. 
our deviation of signal or frequency is going to happen in this area and we want that response to be as flat as possible. And of course it's drifted. Or did my crystal shift on me? Let's see, we've got five, three, four, nine, nine, nine. Nope, that's right on the money. Oh, it's moved back over. That's another thing. These these receivers drift around quite a bit. Uh, this doesn't have an AFC an, or an automatic frequency control circuit in it like modern receivers do. These tend to move around horribly. So you're constantly chasing the tuning on these things. There's even a notation right on the front of the receiver to tune very carefully because they know it's important that you're right on frequency. I sure would like to get this side up just a little bit. Let's see what happens when I go back to the converter stage here. I'm going to just move it over. There's that converter stage. That actually looks pretty damn uniform but we are rolling off more now because we're going through two IF filters so the bandpass has been constricted just a little bit. Come on, get back on frequency. What do we got going on here? We have something coming apart. What did I just do? There we go. Because these are basically VHF receivers, i.e. very high frequency receivers, even the location, even where you stick your test probe in here can make a difference. Boy, that shifted on me, didn't it? That's a little better. Let me whack the IF cans. I don't want to lose too much gain. see if I can bring the right back up now. I'm going through all of them at this point and just touching up. No, I've got to try to bring that right hand side up a little bit. Not happy with the... There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. I'm a little happier with that. We picked up some of the lost gain and we're fairly uniform across. A little hump in the middle. Yeah, let's see what I can do to flatten that out. You start getting OCD when you do this. We got uh, marker amplitude. Let's turn it way down. That's another thing you have to be careful of. If you have too much marker amplitude, it distorts the pattern so badly you can't really see what's happening. So you try to keep your marker level down low so you have a better idea of what your pattern looks like. This marker width I don't think does much. Yeah, it does a little bit, spreads it out. Typically I leave that on minimum. Thank you. 
Yeah, let's see if we can do a little bit better. Okay, I played around a little bit, and if you take a look at the center of that, it's almost dead flat across the top of the response curve and just starts to fall off at the 75 kilohertz points. Is that still centered? Yes, there it is. Now bear in mind with FM frequency, the audio frequency controls the speed at which the carrier shifts back and forth. The amplitude or volume of the signal is based on how far it deviates to either side. So having it roll off over here means that louder passages, the louder the music or the volume or the voice gets, it just means the volume would roll off a little bit as the deviation got extremely high. So it's not going to have a huge effect on the frequency response because the frequency itself is based on how fast the carrier is swinging back and forth. Now you need enough bandwidth for the carrier to do that but we're going to affect volume at the top end a little bit more than anything right, now, right uh, with that. That looks pretty good. It's damn flat across the center. I'm happy with that. We've got 150 kilohertz of bandwidth And this damn thing's moved again. That's pretty uniform on both sides. So I'm going to call that good and I'm going to move on to tuning the ratio detector. Okay, now we're hooked up to our ratio detector. That should be uniformly centered on our IF. This line should be straight and we should have an equal response on both sides of the IF. They use a 120 hertz uh, sawtooth generator, which I don't have, but they didn't have a scope that had a reticle with calibrated divisions on it either. Most of the scopes back in those days, the oscillograph, quote unquote, most of them didn't even have a calibrated sweep they had a potentiometer that varied the sweep or they could go into XY mode. In fact, a lot of them didn't even have a calibrated volts per division. All they had was a, a potentiometer and you'd have to measure against a reference. We have the advantage of having a newer oscilloscope. So let's see what happens when I tweak the coil here on my ratio detector. That's the wrong way. That's coming closer. Oh. Look at that. We have an almost dead straight line, which means our response curve is going to be fairly flat across the bandwidth. In fact, our bandwidth only runs from the center frequency here. One division to the left and one division to the right is our 75 kilohertz. And we extend well beyond that with a straight line. We're one, two and a half divisions up one two and a half divisions down almost it's just a little bit off let's see if i can tweak it that's almost perfect centered on our if we have a straight response curve in our ratio detector so we'll have a fairly even frequency response across the whole spectrum i'd say we're done the next steps that they ask for doing here now are doing the RF alignment which is just like you would do with any AM radio it's the same process you put your signal generator in go to the low end of the band adjust the coil go to the high end of the band adjust the capacitor adjust the oscillator yada yada it's identical so there's no reason for us to go through that and I happen to know this receiver is pretty much dead on the money frequency wise anyway but you've seen hundreds and hundreds of uh, AM radio alignments. The RF alignment on this is virtually identical. Well, with one small exception. Let me move down here. <clears throat> this is our coil right here. Oscillator coil. 
where on an AM radio or your typical shortwave radio, there'd be a slug in there to adjust the low end. You would do it on these by bending the coil. There's only three turns of wire there, so you'd squeeze them together or stretch them apart to shift the frequency. No need to do it on this. It's it's on the money and again it's the same thing as an AM alignment. I'm gonna call this done. I'm gonna hook it up and see what it sounds like. Alright, moment of truth here. Let's uh, turn this thing on and see what we get. A lot of noise from my camera power supply. I thought there was a talk station down here somewhere. Yeah. Blend of botanical, optimal dose of melatonin, so you can fall asleep naturally with no next day grogginess. It's available in both liquid and gummies. Tastes great and. 16 possibilities. Let's say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to begin. <laughs> Rock 101 and it's exactly on 101. Alright, sounds pretty good. I'm going to throw that in the case. I'm going to call it done. And that's all there is to it. No reason to be afraid of FM alignment if you can grab yourself one of these signal generators. And any of these series will work. The one that I used, this older model right here, works fine also. And we have a slightly newer version of it here. All of these will do the job for you. They can be picked up at the flea market for, you know, between probably $30 and $40. Recap them, give them a case of coat of paint, maybe put a new handle on it if you're so inclined. And you can do your own FM alignments. They're not very scary. It just takes time. Just be methodical, follow the instructions. Get yourself an inexpensive scope if you have one of those cheap, uh, uh, they have these little kits that you can put together. It's a digital scope. If you happen to have one of those, that'll work fine. You only need a few hundred kilohertz of bandwidth. Actually, you only need uh, 60 hertz of bandwidth because it's a 60 hertz sweep. But don't go out and buy one of those kits. You can buy a real oscilloscope uh, for pretty short money. I'm going to turn around here. And I say this every time. I pick these scopes up at the flea market all the time. This one I've had for years, but I pick up these old analog scopes for a dollar a megahertz all the time. And something with 10, 15, 20, 25 megahertz of bandwidth is more than adequate. 
and they can be had for a dollar a megahertz if you're just insistent. If they come with probes, okay, you're going to pay another ten to fifteen dollars for each probe, and hopefully it comes with a manual. But uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money for an expensive oscilloscope to do this. This this oscilloscope here is claimed to have a thirty megahertz or thirty. I think it's thirty megahertz bandwidth. And it doesn't. It, it starts falling down around 20 megahertz. It starts falling off very quickly. But we're not using any of that bandwidth. The sweep that comes out of that unit down below here, the uh, this one right here, in fact all of this series, it's a 60 cycle sweep, 60 hertz. That's all it has to respond to is a 60 hertz sweep and a DC signal voltage to make the, the IF curve. So don't be afraid to give this a shot, and I know this was a little disjointed, I'm getting old and my memory's shot and I have trouble finding my words these days. But if I can still do an alignment, you can do an alignment. Uh, I wanted to ship one of these older units over to Dave Tipton, but God, they're like 35 pounds and to ship that over to Australia would cost a fortune. But he just recently restored an AM FM shortwave receiver. I believe it was from Germany and he didn't have the equipment to do the FM alignment on it so he skipped over that and I felt bad I said golly if I lived anywhere close to him I would just swing by and hand him one I don't know if he has access to the ham well yeah there's ham flea markets in Australia but I don't know what kind of equipment shows up over there at any rate we're gonna call this one done I'm gonna throw it back in the cabinet and uh, move on. Well, that's pretty much it. I should mention, if you're looking around in the flea markets for FM converters, make sure you get one that's in the 87 to 108 range, or 88 to 108 range. Um, initially, back in the late 40s, uh, when FM first came out, when Armstrong first started making sets and Sarnoff was selling them and cheated him out of his money, they were in the 42 to 50 megahertz range, which is low band VHF used for uh, you know public service and police these days. And channel four, I think, had sound in that range. I forget now; it's been so long. But at any rate, there are FM converters that go from 42 to 50 megahertz, and they're useless today because the FM band is now at 88 to 108. They needed more spectrum room, and they found out that there were less problems in the spring and fall with uh, stations like from the west coast coming in. I can remember listening to police calls when they used to use low band VHF in, the, in that region. In the spring and fall, we could listen to places out in California, police calls from California, because they'd skip across the United States. This band tends not to do that that much. This is up getting into VHF, the high band VHF, so it doesn't have as many of those skip properties off the ionosphere. It does occasionally happen, but not nearly as much as the low band VHF did. I guess that's it. Uh, give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. Sorry about the stammering and stuttering all the way through this. I'm just, I was just uh, reminiscing with a friend of mine the other day saying that I used to be able to sit down and do these hour long videos in one take and then split them in half and just do them non stop. But it just isn't there anymore. I just can't keep the train of thought coming out of my head. I guess that's all the fun of getting old. We're not sure what we're going to do next for a project. I've got to, uh, I've got to find something to work on. No flea markets. Maybe I'll have to work on some commercial gear. 
uh, down on the main test bench down below and do a video on something on down there. But for now, I'm the radio mechanic. Hope somebody found this somewhat worthwhile. I hope I've alleviated some fears about going ahead and aligning these FM sets from uh, you know these old tube FM sets. It's not that hard. You just need the equipment to do it, and the equipment is available. You can buy those sets. I think uh, this set here. Whoop, where'd it go? Down here. This one I think I paid. I'm trying to remember. Thirty-five dollars for that probably. Of course, I had to put another thirty dollars worth of capacitors in it and change all the connectors on the front over to BNC. Most of this gear has those silly old Amphenol microphone type jacks where you thread the connector on. They're just worthless. Um, and besides, everything today is BNC. It's so much easier to deal with, convert them over to BNC, and it's easy. You don't even have to change the diameter of the hole. Those Amphenol thread-on microphone type connectors use the same size hole as a BNC uh, bulkhead mount. So it's just unscrew one and screw the other one in, solder one wire on, and you're done. The same thing with these signal generators here. The next thing I have to do to this is convert these stupid pin jacks over to BNC. I do have a couple of bulkhead BNCs, but I want to put a red one and a black one for positive and negative, even though those are both black. So I ordered a bag of reds and blacks today. I'd run out of them. I used to have a drawer full of the things. Pin jacks, you just never seem to have the right size pin to fit them. They always pull out when you tug on the cable a little bit. Uh, I hate the things, just can't stand them. The other two signal generators, I forget what I paid for these. I think this one here was about $35 or $36, and I had to recap it and uh, strip the paint and repaint it. And this one here, I don't remember, it was probably in the same price range, you know, with another 30 bucks or 20 bucks worth of capacitors in it. But I wanted to see how the different vintages work, and they all work just fine. So if you see one of those in the flea market, go ahead and pick it up. Now I've been looking at them on eBay, looking at those and looking at these, and the prices that they're asking for these are absolutely stupid. People seem to think they're going to get $200 for these or $175 for those. You can buy a modern solid state analog signal generator for this for less money and, and have a new piece of equipment on the bench. Why anyone would think that paying that much money for one of these is or asking that much money for one of these is reasonable. I don't want and on top of that then they want $35 or $40 to ship the stupid thing. On top of asking $200 for those generators, this just asinine. Don't pay it. Don't give them the satisfaction. Make them eat the thing. But if you go to the flea market, you can pick them up pretty reasonable because there's usually people with you know boatloads of this old gear that's been sitting in the barn or sitting in the basement, and they just want to get rid of it. And you don't have to pay shipping if you buy them at the electronic fleas. Look around get on the internet look for ham radio flea markets they're out there my god I get more people I can't find them well you're not looking because they exist all you have to do is do a search be diligent and you will come up with ham radio flea markets now it's going to be tough with this CCP virus going around and there's going to be a lot of them canceled there was supposed to be one this May it was canceled there's supposed to be one in October. I think they've moved it out to November, and then they've moved the uh, ARRL flea market that was going to happen in Massachusetts. I think that's going to be in November this year, of all things. I'm going to try to make them. That's it for now, guys. Uh, again, thanks for riding along. I appreciate your being here. If you stuck through to the end, you're a trooper. Uh, and like Eric O., from Main Street, uh, South Main Street Auto says, if I can do it, you can do it. If you haven't watched his channel, he's probably one of the best automotive diagnosticians I've ever seen. He just knows how to troubleshoot. He's an interesting guy to watch. That's it for now. We'll catch up with you later. Take care. Oh, and stop by and say, see Dave Tipton. Uh, subscribe to him. I think you'll enjoy his videos. He does some amazing stuff with some pretty rough equipment. 
are uh, when, I, when I say rough equipment, I mean the radios are pretty rough, not his gear. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye.